Welcome to Seek Reality. I'm Roberta Grimes, and I'm so happy you're with us today. Oh, my dear friends, here at Seek Reality, we all love a wonderful, a triumphant story. And some months ago, a speaker's agent sent me what I thought was a story that was actually too good to be true, frankly, and it seemed impossible. After an accident in 2003 left Brandy Gilmore wheelchair-bound and in pain, and doctors told her, well, you know, there's... Nothing more we can do, so that's going to be your life for the rest of your life. And she's young and gorgeous, but that was it. She wouldn't accept that. She began searching for a cure, and eventually she figured out how to cure herself. Brandy discovered research that changed the course of her life, and she made a complete recovery. But for her, that was just the beginning. After she healed herself in 2010, she didn't want to just talk about her healing. She wanted to prove to others that our minds really do possess the power to heal our bodies a lot more than just, you know, the placebo effect. And in 2015, Brandy made that goal a reality when for the first time she was able to demonstrate self-healing in real time under thermal medical imaging. She proved it to doctors. Talk about scratching your head after that. They were scratching everything they had. Then soon after that, she was invited to deliver a TEDx talk, which was a pivotal moment in her journey. And since then, Brandy has continued to demonstrate amazing healing results using thermal medical imaging, proving objectively that what she does is real. She demonstrates these results on her own podcast, which is called Heal Yourself, Change Your Life, and in speaking engagements for medical professionals and general audiences, too. Her wonderful book, which is just out this year, is called Master Your Mind and Energy to Heal Your Body, and it's beautiful. I've read, I read her book. Several researchers and doctors have referred to that book as a must-read. And I know because I've spent my life trying to get through to very thick-headed scientists. If you if you've got the, the the scientific people believing what you do, you have done something amazing right there. But it holds an incredible missing key to healing. The reality is that our minds possess much more ability than science has ever given them credit for to heal, to go far beyond the placebo effect. And Brandy's new books help readers understand the missing link to mind-body healing and provides a simple step-by-step -step process on how we all can access that hidden, hidden healing potential that is in our own minds. Brandy Gilmore was recently our guest, and I loved having her with us so much. We've just been chatting beforehand. We're late getting started doing this podcast because, frankly, we could have chatted all day. I thought her information was so important for you to hear that I put her right back into our guest rotation as soon as I could. So she's she's here again. Brandy, welcome back. I'm so glad to have you here back with us, and I can't wait to start talking. Roberta, likewise, I just, I, you know, even after the last interview, I hung up just going, you, you're just one of those people that I could just hug. Like you, I just, I know we've known each other in a past life or something. I just, you're, you're just beautiful. So thank you so much for having me back. And it's wonderful. I, to I, I again. feel the same way. She, she said, why don't we get together for tea? Where do you live? I said, Austin. She said, oh, well, she lived in California. We figure that's just like next door, isn't it? Just about next door. Next door. I mean, <laughs> anymore, you know, you travel and, or meet people all over the world. So Texas to California, pretty much next door. <laughs> I I now I can't really recall how you got injured, but was it an auto accident or something? Yeah, so I I used to do network engineering and operations, and but I had an auto accident, and then I also had a fall, and I fell just wrong, just right, however you want to say it. But I literally yeah. went from living a full life to wheelchair walker cane. Um, on a good day, I could get around with my wheelchair or walker or cane. On a bad day, I didn't get out of bed. I was on morphine. Um, I was an absolute mess, and and my doctor said there was nothing else they could do for me. And so, it. you know, Don't you love doctors? yeah, you know, what's that? Don't you love how doctors, it's easy for them to say when it's your life? <laughs> you know, that was, this is the thing is, and I, 
I went through a variety of different phases. And for like, I had, I loved my doctors and I was a little frustrated because I wasn't getting better. But I had this epiphany as I was working on healing myself. And it was this, I remember laying there and I was just in all of this pain and I had been injured for a few years. And I had seen my doctor earlier that day, you know, a 15 minute appointment, 20 minute, whatever it was to get, I had triplicates at the time. So like a, a form to get my morphine refilled and blah, blah, blah. Cause I had been on a form of morphine. And so you go in and it's like, I remember, you know, a 15 minute, whatever it is, appointment to get the medication refilled and et cetera. But I remember laying there And I had this epiphany and I thought, you know, right now I have no future. I have no real chance of a future. And, and I had this vision just popped in my head of my doctor, you know, eating dinner with his family, which he should be like eating dinner with his family. But in that moment, I really thought about the awareness that my future wasn't really being tended to by anybody. If you think about it, you know, I I really, that's what there was like different pivotal moments where I felt like I really have to do something. Nobody's fighting for me to have a future. I mean, yes, Yes. my doctors were lovely, but I mean, I know as soon as I left, he went with the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. If, if, if a total of five, 10, 15 minutes are being devoted to my future, like I was, it really made me say, I have to figure this out. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I was just another so number, you did another all person. This research, and you discovered that the mind has properties. People just yeah, you know, it, there there were certain things that really opened up my mind. For example, the fact that people with multiple personality disorder can have different illnesses in different personalities was mind blowing. And there was even research of a woman who was blind in some personalities, but not in others. And when you stop and think about it, you say, well, (laughs) and medically documented, not, you know, pretending to be blind, but when you stop and you see all these awarenesses, and then I think something else that was really pivotal for me was this is because I had been trying to all of the things, the positive thinking, the meditation, and, and while all those things can be great. I still wasn't healing. And I, I went through a period of time and I meditated in theta state and, and trying to heal. And it wasn't, it wasn't healing my body. And I thought there has to be something more. And one of the epiphanies that I had was this, was I thought about people who take the placebo, you know, a fake pill. Right. And they can get some type of results. And I thought, well, they don't have to meditate for five years to get results. Cause I still wasn't right. getting results. And I thought, they're not having to meditate or be in theta state for years or even people with multiple personality disorder to switch between personalities. They have immediate responses. They don't have to meditate for years and years and years. And again, nothing negative about meditation. It can be great, but I had been doing all of the things for years and it wasn't working. And I thought there had to be a way to get faster results. And I think that also was an epiphany for me. Of course, of course. So, so what happened that made you get it? And suddenly, what did you do? You know, what was, what was the magic? What did I do? The magic, I would say there was, there was multiple pieces. One piece of magic was understanding that consciousness isn't, understanding consciousness in a new way. Yes. You know, we all hear the term consciousness and sometimes we think about consciousness as a way of okay, being coming aware of energy, becoming aware of our thoughts help create our lives. And that is a level of consciousness, becoming aware. Yes. But I would also say understanding the consciousness behind emotions yes. was another awareness. huge. And huge. And because in a simple way, I started looking at this as I thought about, you know, if somebody's really, really in love, what do they see in a person? They see all of the good. If somebody's really, really angry or hurt or upset towards a person, what do they see? They see all of the negative, but they don't tell their brain, hey, just see all the positive or hey, just see all the negative. It does it automatically. And similarly, people will see through fear or see through the lens of victim or see through life, through these different lenses. And the problem is 
is that these emotional patterns can affect our health and then they attract more of the pattern that repeats in our lives. And then we see it everywhere. And so we become surrounded by that which is making us ill, not necessarily always because we're surrounded by it, but we're also perceiving that we're surrounded by it. Right, right, right. And then and then we feel like there's no way to necessarily get out of it because it's just how life is or how the world is. But it's not necessarily reality. It's our consciousness. Which, and you create and, that reality. Yes. Exactly. And so, and, and so part of what I started doing, as you mentioned in the beginning, you know, there's a, there's a part of me that's very, loves to back everything with science. And then also loves to look at an expanded consciousness and awareness. But if we look at it and we bring science into this, yes, we could look at it like this. We can look at the awareness that if we look at psychology, we know there's something called repetition, compulsion, or reenactments, or attachment theory, or we could call it law of attraction, or we could call it revictimization. But very simply, patterns breed more of the same. So if we think about, unfortunately, maybe a woman who has an abusive father, she can leave him and find the abusive boyfriend, boss, spouse, et cetera, et cetera. So those patterns can continue. And we know that in psychology, so we can see, or even if we think about re-victimization or, or uh, reenactments or um, repetition compulsion, what that is, is we know that the mind has a tendency to want to repeat old patterns. Yes. And we attract them. So we look at energy and we could say, okay, we're attracting the energy of it. But it, so it shapes our consciousness. It attracts the energy of it. And, and so we have these, so, so getting out of, so getting, enabling ourselves to heal, we need to shift consciousness. And it's not just about the consciousness that we can heal. And it's not just about the consciousness that our thoughts help create our lives, but it's also shifting the consciousness of emotions that are also surrounding us, if that makes sense. Oh, it does. Because emotions, consciousness is literally governed by emotions. That exactly. the emotions, yes, the emotions govern our lives to an incredible extent people have no idea so what you did was you really grounded yourself in that in that knowledge in that ability to shift your emotions that way that's remarkable it, exactly and so we'll see that was a key was understanding exactly that the the consciousness of emotions and i would say another key was understanding that it takes multiple emotions and that is another, a, a huge key. And one way to think about it is like this, is that it, as I started looking and I said, okay, well, we know stress affects the physical body. I mean, yes. studies from Harvard it even have even shown and even suggest that stress can create autoimmune conditions oh, or that, yeah. Or even um, we've all heard before of maybe um, the widowhood effect or broken heart syndrome where somebody can die from a broken heart. And so if we know that somebody can die from a broken heart or even scared to death, you know, a person can be so scared, their heart just stops. And so we can see the emotions affect the body. Now I started looking at objectively and saying, but wait a second, there are also people who have PTSD or severe trauma who aren't physically sick. How does that work? And so what I began to figure out was it is a combination of emotions. And the analogy that I always use is, you know, it's like if somebody wants to make cake and they have flour, they can't make cake. But if they have flour and mix it with eggs and butter, vegan eggs and butter and other ingredients, et cetera, now they can make cake. And if they change right. the ingredients, they can make a completely different recipe. Now, that's how I became to realize that if somebody had multiple personality disorder, how that was possible for them to have one illness and one personality and another personality that's completely healthy and another personality that has different issues. And so, because of that, that combination. Now, another key was the awareness that if we think about some of those ingredients, if you will, one of them even has to do with the self-image. And so let's say somebody's emotional consciousness is that they are a sick person and you know, maybe they see themselves as being like their mother or father right then that yeah 
so our identity, like the way we see ourselves. So if somebody sees themselves as being sick, they could recreate that over and over. Or if they see themselves as being inferior, then they're always feeling that emotion of feeling less than. And so it's it's really understanding that there are key ingredients and it's not just about changing an emotion and being happy. Yes, happiness is great, but we have to transform emotions to the extent that it also then shifts our consciousness. Brandy, I have known people who have exactly those issues. You have as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and we all have our, our things, you know, it's, it's, it's so funny that when we come into this world, we, we have, you know, patterns that we all have our, our different challenges, but when we start to identify the specific things and, and transform them and grow, it's pivotal. And that's one of the things that I really love about, I hate to say it, but what I really love about having to have gone through a health issue and, and resolve it is that I feel like it's like a check engine light, if you will, on a car, where it's like if you drive a car and the check engine light comes on, you know that there's something wrong and you know you need to fix it. And mm -hmm. similarly, a health issue is exactly that. It's like a spiritual check engine light that says, hey, something is off. A health you need to fix issue it. is a spiritual check engine light. <laughs> I'm going to try to remember that. That's great. <laughs> All right. I it have is. read your book, but I read it like five, four or five months ago, and I can't remember the punchline. So how did you start to apply all of this to yourself? That's what I can't recall. And I'm just, I can't wait till we get to that part. So talk about that. You know, what I did is I started saying, okay, well, I can see that there's different emotions affect the physical body. And of course, part of me was still skeptical. If somebody had told me when I first started my, my journey that I could heal using my mind, I probably would have been offended or thought they were crazy. Uh, so now again, oh, you know, really? my injury. This is terrible. I'm in a terrible position. I can't do this. Of course I can't do this. You would have thought. Oh yeah, absolutely. And none of that. I have a physical accident, a physical injury. Like, of course I'm not going to be like, yes, how is this possible? I get it. I totally get it. Oh, that's right. But then when you see that even people who go into positive state of mind, even after surgery, where there's clearly a physical cut, uh, can even heal faster with positivity. And if they have negative, stressful mindset, they have higher risk of complications, rehospitalization, all of the problems come in you know and, so and so we can see to it change out. your own mind that's the first thing you had to do right yes and i would say that also getting very specific was key so one of the things that i started doing is i started to realize how much our bodies are really speaking to us so like the spiritual check engine light if you will and one thing I did was I love it. Lawrence Bolshin okay. had this was like a metaphysical teacher from the early 1900s that said something along the lines of, you know, if if you can't hear, then maybe some or if you're having some problem with your ears, then maybe you don't want to hear. And so what I started to do was I really took that whole general concept to the next level and said, OK, well, wait a second here. And I started thinking about messages that the body might be giving us. And what I began to realize is as I thought about idioms, as I thought about like different things, like somebody possibly having neck pain, for example, uh, I started thinking about what, what does that mean? What is that? And I thought, oh, well, wait a second. We have the wording pain in the neck or somebody might feel like, somebody's going to stab them in the back and they have stabbing pain in their back. Right. So that was another, so kind of like one of my issues was that I had CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome. And so I started asking myself, which is basically like an abnormal response from the nervous system. And so I started asking myself, why is my nervous system having an abnormal response? And so I started asking myself, why is, why is my nervous system in a heightened state? And that's what led me to the events of 9-11. And I started realizing 
that I had gone through a what I a, a trauma, so to speak, in 9-11, but I wouldn't have realized that it was a trauma. Because I at the time I I didn't think it impacted me because I wasn't actually there, but I was on the phone with people who were in the towers. And so I think that oh. was that, that was pivotal. Then it would have it would have affected you, of course it would have. People you knew were there. Yeah. So at the time I had mentioned that I did network engineering and operations and I worked um, in here, here in California, but my shift was 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. So I was on the phone with a colleague in the trade towers when everything happened. And and basically my colleague started yelling and saying, help me, help me. And then the phone went dead. And then after that, as I was, you know, of course, it just goes silent. You go, what do you do? And then you, and then I saw on the news as I was watching it, you know, the planes hit. And so it's like the news came on. And so we're all just sitting there in the, in the company that I worked with, we're all just like, and then because we had a lot of equipment also in the buildings, all of a sudden, then all of our phones are going crazy because everybody's network is down and, and all of these things. So I just went to work trying to help support people. But what else was happening at that time is in working in telecommunications, we always had to have no current events. So there was televisions on every single pillar around me. And so as I was working, trying to help people in the background, the footage was playing over and over on all of the televisions that surrounded me. And then for months and months and months afterwards, it was, you know, are we in red zone? Are we in or for terrorist attack? You know, if you remember, it was like, well, are we on high alert? And so in the back of my mind, there was a lot of things going on. It was one, I felt like I was, you know, supposed to die to save others. And then another thing was, are we going to like, is there, are we being attacked? So it was playing eight to 10 hours a day, you know, depending upon if I worked overtime that day in the back of my mind. And so I would say that even though consciously how I felt was, I just felt about caring for other people, that information got stored in my subconscious mind and I just suppressed it. And so when I started asking the question of why is my nervous system having an abnormal response, what I began to realize is that part of me wanted to die to save others and part of me expected that I was going to die. Yeah, I think a lot of people were. Oh, yeah. And then I also had the negative effect, even if they were not there. Even if they didn't yeah. know somebody who was there, it it affected the whole country in that very negative way. Um, I was flying at the time on business quite a bit, and uh, getting on a plane was difficult after for a while after that. Oh, I'm sure. You, know, you always look for where the exit is. You always think of what you would do if um, you know. It, Everyone was thinking, uh, I will, I'll be the one to take the terrorists down. I don't care about me. I'll, I'll save everybody else. Yeah. I remember that time very well. Yeah. So it just, um, and I would say that part of what happened, I think it, you know, I think you bring up a really good point and it's this, it's that everybody can go through a trauma or a specific disaster or whatnot. And people process it in a different way, right? Yeah. And so in my situation, I also, I felt a lot of survivor's guilt and I felt guilty for not dying to go save others. And then I felt like I was going to die. It was all of these things. Plus I had had patterns of this since childhood of, uh, of feeling those feelings of supposed to die to save others. Now, if I expand on this a bit more, it's a simple way to think about this is like this, is let's say that there's a natural disaster, like flooding, for example, or a hurricane or whatnot. Now, what happens is this, is that let's say two different people, one person, let's say, is normally feeling very fulfilled in their life. So they're feeling very fulfilled, very loved, very connected. And then the natural disaster happens, they might feel completely uprooted and feel like they have disconnect from their community. Yes. Now, yes. another person who may go through the exact same experience, who was maybe feeling lonely before that happened, lonely and disconnected, may have this disaster and they may feel a sense of community and connection more mm -hmm. than ever in their life. Yes. Yeah. So- yeah. 
Yes. So one person can link up a disaster and link it up to feeling disconnected from their community and their family. And another person can go through a disaster and feel a greater sense of community and connection than ever, because now they feel like friends and family are reaching out. Yes. And so one, and so the problem becomes this is that one person will link it to love and one person links it to loss of love. And that's also part of healing. Yeah. Okay. Is that for some people, the same is so some, for some people, so we get miswired mind programming in our mind that then also creates a problem when it comes to healing. And so meaning this, you know, people who've been working with the mind for a long period of time, we've all heard, get rid of negative energy, get rid of your wounding, get rid of your trauma, all of these things. But if we think about it for a moment, we can have, uh, like, for example, somebody who has a pride in hardship. So if somebody has a pride in hardship, do they want to get rid of all of the negativity? Well, no, because it's connected to their pride. And so that's exactly the point is that we can go through traumas and it can affect us differently, but also even when it comes to releasing, we have to really work to rewire the mind for genuine healing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some people, for example, uh, can get it linked up that illness is getting them more love and connection, in which case, even if they don't want it, the body and the subconscious mind may still want illness because it feels like it's getting them love or they cling to it. Yes. yes. Yeah. Even though they don't even want it consciously, consciously, that if you ask them, they did. Would people still love me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or even um, um, when we think about it, um, if we think about how miswired the mind can be, if we think about for a moment, you know, unfortunately a cutter, We've all heard before somebody with self-harm, a cutter may cut themselves and experience feelings of relief or euphoria or control or safety from cutting themselves. And of course, that doesn't make logical sense, but those things can get linked up in the mind. And so point being is that, you know, when we were talking earlier and we said, okay, part of what I did to heal was I really mastered my emotions. And a key to doing that was understanding that emotions could be miswired and then changing that meaning survivor's guilt. I felt good for being a guilty person. Like I felt, if I felt good, it meant that I was good. If I felt guilty, it meant that I was good. Like I had a conscience. Oh, our minds are so complex, aren't they? Oh my goodness. And even to try to understand why you're feeling what you're feeling is important. And yet it's hard in some ways to really dig down and understand it because then you wonder about your own self. Oh my goodness. Exactly. So but I see, but, but that's the key is what it is, is like this is that, you know, even if we'd go to get rid of an old shirt or an old, whatever it is from our house, if part of us wants to get rid of it and the other part wants to keep it, it's going to feel like a struggle. Yeah. And in our minds, all of the time, people want to get rid of some type of trauma or hurt or wounding, but then another part of the mind feels like it's keeping them safe or it's so, so like a trauma, they go, Oh, I have to hold on to it. So it'll keep me safe just in case it ever happens again. So what <laughs> happens, part of us wants to get rid of it. Part of us wants to hold on to it and it makes it hard. But when we understand this, if we just work with the mind and rewire it, that's the key. It's a different so consciousness how did you regarding resolve love. This so you could get rid of that wheelchair. How did you how did you put it all together? What I started doing, I, I had to program my mind that said, guilt does not make me a good person. It does not mean that I have a good conscience. It means that I feel horrible. Don't do that. <laughs> so, but I had to really rewire my mind. <laughs> Because I felt like I was a good person. It meant I had a conscience, you know, and, and I had grown up Lutheran. And so I had the, the religious skill. It was oh, like, oh, that's was, a tough one. It really, it really is. <laughs> oh, so man. it was, I also felt that holding on to the fear was keeping me safe. And so 
I had to to let that go completely as well. Like fear is not keeping me safe. I and I not only that, but then the other part. The part of me that felt like I needed to die for others and the best thing to do was to die for others. I thought, well, wait, what if I just live and be my best self? <laughs> That's a much better a, plan, what Brandy. A <laughs> oh, what a concept What's that? that is. What a concept. Yeah. Much better idea. <laughs> yeah. Especially since you're young and gorgeous. Wouldn't it be nice to live a life that matches how you look? That would be wonderful. Isn't it great? You're so sweet. You're so sweet. Thank you. And it just so exactly. So I started correcting the wiring in my mind and that was really powerful. Now, what was also, you know, I mentioned that as I changed, you know, that basically the illness is like a check engine light on the car, if you will. And the beautiful thing is, is as I started changing these specific patterns, not only did I heal myself, my life got better in so many ways. And then I developed this ability to then feel what other people are feeling and channel information. I mean, that's when I show people under medical equipment, how they can get results and, and show it. That's exactly what I do is I check in and see, I say, okay, well, what emotions is this person feeling? And then I show them and I just show them to shift their emotions. And you can literally see on the scan where you know, let's say somebody has neck pain or back pain or, you know, whatever pain, what happens on these scans is this, is um, with thermography, it's it, it's basically it's the simple way to think about it is that if somebody has an injury or an illness, it emits heat. Just like if, you know, if somebody has a sprained ankle, if you've ever, or an infection, and it's like, if you touch that area, it emits heat from the body. And so what medical thermography does is it detects that heat that's in the body. Uh -huh. And it and so under these scans, if somebody has neck pain, you'd see a large red area where their pain is or back pain. You'd see a large red area where the back pain is. Right. And I'll show people to how to use their mind. And you'll literally see the scan go from red to green as their pain goes away. And it's it's incredible. And they do it. I just help them wow. to identify their pains. Yeah, the emotions and shift them. And so that, that what you that's what you did with your with your pain, you were able to eliminate it just using your mind. That, Absolutely. That's and amazing. it was amazing. Identifying the, the specific emotions and, and transforming them. And and it's like when we transform the specific emotions, the body has a ability to heal itself. And I know it sounds to me, it would have sounded impossible. But one way to think about it is like this, is if we think about somebody who has a stroke, let's say they have a right brain stroke that can affect the left side of the body right. or a left brain yeah. stroke yes. can affect yeah. the right side of the body. And so I started to think about it kind of like an emotional stroke, if you will. You know, if, if the emotional activity is here from an emotion, where could it affect the body and, and where is it showing up? Or if it's over here or over here or over here, where is it affecting the body? Because I started to think about it. If we can have a brain injury and it can affect the corresponding part of the body, well, every part of the body is controlled by the brain. And so that's what made me start saying, well, okay, well, what emotions and what, what part of the brain can affect the corresponding corresponding part of the body and how can we transform that and that's what I started really thinking about it like as an emotional stroke if you will and not that emotions are like strokes though just that they can create brain activity and more than most people realize in in fact trauma or PTSD can actually change the shape of the brain so they can actually have a very real effect on the brain and so that that's the way I started looking at it and it was just um helpful to understand that as we then create that healing and the emotional healing it can enable our body to heal itself so you found that you were able then to eliminate your own pain and completely and then and i started going to, to stand up and walk and not only that but then i started working out um at the gym i started <laughs> going to the gym with bodybuilders and these bodybuilders, so I would initially, when I would go into the gym, 
I would just hold the weight because I was still trying to just figure out and, and I got rid of a lot of the pain, but I was still afraid to move too much. I didn't want it to come back. Mm -hmm. I was you know, still figuring out the process then. And so I would just hold the weight and then I would leave. And that's where I started. And after a couple months, I, I mean, I was making huge progress. These bodybuilders came up to me and I mean, huge and grandmaster champion body bodybuilder his name was roger and her name was donna his wife and she was a figure competition and they said we have never seen anybody make the progress that you have made we've been watching you and if you ever want to work out with us you can work out with us so then i said yes and so yeah. then i started working out with these uh bodybuilders and and just and and just kept going kept going and working on running and I mean, all of the things, it was just um, incredible. And so pivotal. And then after I got better, that's when I thought after, like, after I had got myself fully healed, that's when I said, okay, I've got to show my doctors. I really want everybody to know that they can do this. And it just became this thing. It was like, after I healed, I thought, okay, I have to show people. So they know that it works. And so that's when I started showing the demonstration of pain. And, and I, I have to say, I see people heal from pain. And the reason I demonstrate with pain is because people can feel immediate results. But I have seen people heal from all kinds of things, from being bedridden, from autoimmune conditions, from low blood. I mean, all kinds of things. I've seen uh, the body heal itself from all kinds of things. It's incredible. It really is unbelievable. I, I when I first read your book, the thing is, I read so many people's books in the course of you know doing this because I don't want to interview people unless I've immediately read their book beforehand. And I remember reading your book and just being blown away by it. I almost couldn't believe it. But you are walking proof that what you do really works. So you give talks about this in the medical community and say, hey, you're, you know, start using this with your your patients because it works so well and and uh do you do you counsel people do you have do you work with people personally who have issues i basically my goal is to empower people so yes i work with some people uh, but a lot of times i'm teaching classes or workshops or retreats or um speaking i really ultimately when we stop and think about it, the more that every single person knows how to use their own mind, yes. the better. The more that every person knows how to heal themselves. I mean, when we look around the world, that's part of the problem is that even when we think about mental health, it's become a right, it, like an increasing problem. More and more people are even just having ha problems with happiness, with positivity. And so uh, personal empowerment is a huge passion of mine because I know what it felt like to beg and hope that somebody would help me. And then from going to a place of then feeling like, hey, I can actually help myself and not just help myself because I had been trying years and years and years, but actually get real results that um, that was pivotal for me. And so that's what I want everybody to experience. And, and, and one way to think about it is kind of like this is, you know, um, realizing what's possible and there's something called are you familiar with the four minute mile have you ever heard of that before well, the fact just the fact that that was a barrier a psychological barrier that people didn't think you could exactly run faster than that yes yeah i mean throughout for, for throughout history people thought it was impossible for the human body to run a mile in under four minutes right and then the man roger bannister did it and after he did so many other people did it. Now, similarly, the more people who hear my story and understand that we could do this and then learn how to do it, the more I see people messaging in saying, hey, I just did this and hey, I healed myself and hey. So that's really what I ultimately want is more and more people to feel that sense of also empowerment. And, and yes, it's a skill because if we think about it for a moment, if somebody asked me, like, if you ask me, can I run a mile in under four minutes? The answer is no. I mean, could I physically I'm fit? Yes, but it takes a certain skill and a practice and an understanding to actually do that. And so what we can see, it's not just belief. I wouldn't just say, well, I believe I can run in under four minutes. I'd have to actually know the skill of doing it. And the same is true with healing with the mind is that 
part of it is belief, is understanding we can do it, but part of it is also understanding that there's a skill to it as well. And so if we combine belief and understanding with the skill, that's how we get there. I'll so, but it's oh, it's a different, yeah. a different barrier. It's the age barrier. Mm -hmm. It used okay. to be, I, well, my grandmother died of old age when she was 68. She truly died of old mm -hmm. age. I'm much older than she is, much. And um, I have been for the past 50 years plus um, helping business owners. And so I have seen people sell their businesses and within a few years die. And so, and I've tried to encourage them not to, I've, in fact, I've helped them, the individuals come up with something else to do that was productive and you'd, because their kids wanted to take over and they couldn't keep their kids from taking over, but they had to come up with something useful to do other than golf because golf is not useful. And um, I think we have to come up with a way for people to understand that the proper retirement age is somewhere north of 80. And because certainly it's going to be, be be that for me. It may be somewhere north of 90. I don't know. But I'm nowhere near retirement age and I'm almost 80 years old. Um, it just. You're almost. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You, that broke up. You're almost 18 80. years old. Is that what you said? <laughs> Aren't you cute? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I mean, it just does not make sense for people to think they have to stop working and sit in a rocking chair. I would not enjoy it. I tried twice to retire because my husband's older than I am. I'm still doing basically the same stuff I was doing when I was 60, which was the first time I tried to retire because my husband wanted me to. I'm still doing the same stuff I was doing at 70 because, again, he wanted me to retire. To retire. People think that they're getting old when they're really not. People exactly, because life says, oh, you should retire here. And then you go, you start to feel old. Exactly. I just, I like, just don't feel any older than I felt at 40. I don't feel any older. Than well, I, I can tell you, you don't look was, any older than 40. So it's a good. <laughs> oh, thank you, dear. I mean, I do look older, but I don't think I look my age. And it's, but it I don't doesn't think even you look matter if I look my age. I don't feel any older. And I. I'm helping people and doing what I enjoy. And why shouldn't I do that stuff? But mm -hmm. people my age are mostly in, you know, they're, they're frankly, mm -hmm. they're very old. And I don't it, need to be old. Yeah, it, old. exactly. And that's the thing. So there's a few things from that is first and foremost, I mean, when we look at optimism, so optimism is a key to healing. So something to look forward to. What are you optimistic or looking forward to? And that is a key to speeding up healing and also just speeding up cellular proliferation. So it keeps you young. So exactly like you're saying, when you, like if you have things that you're looking forward to doing on a regular basis where you're looking forward to things, it, it that is, it, it speeds up the cells and the cell repair. And so it will keep you looking fantastic like you. Um, <laughs> For that very but, reason. But the point is, people don't have to get old. We have to get that word out to people. It's aging is a choice that we don't have to make. I would absolutely agree. It's I would optional. Absolutely, mm -hmm. I would absolutely. And there's another, there's a, there's a few things. This is what happens, though, is that people might have start having low energy. And what will happen, the problem is, is then they go, oh, well, I have low energy because I'm getting old. That's right. Now, That's right. exactly. Yeah. But you just have yeah. low energy because you've made lifestyle choices that take away your energy, that sap your energy. And absolutely. That's a choice. So you make different lifestyle choices. Exactly. And, and a couple of reasons that I'll see people who have low energy is either one thing is this, is they might have an internal argument inside where they're like frustrated or annoyed about this or annoyed about that. And it, it zaps their energy. And one way to think about it is kind of like this, uh, one woman described it perfectly where she said, 
you know, whenever her and her spouse got in a fight, she immediately felt just drained and exhausted. And so some people have an ongoing fight or argument with life that's frustrations or annoyances or this, that, that's zapping their energy. But my dear, and, and then how old. many people you could teach who are 55, 60, 65, 70, and you could tell them aging is optional. Mm -hmm. It is optional. It is. It is absolutely. And, you know, it, it is. And this is what happens is as people get older, typically speaking, what can happen is the body's repair system can slow down. Not because they're getting older necessarily, because it's kind of like this. After I healed myself, one of the first things my mother said to me after, of course, celebrating that I could run, like that I was working on running and all of these things. And she was in tears and it was it was very sweet. But then after all that, she said, wow, you look so much younger. <laughs> I said, thank you. You didn't tell me I looked old in the first place. But <laughs> and so we, we joked around about that. But my point is, we've all seen before where somebody maybe goes through a stressful divorce or a stressful time in their life and they look aged and then they come out of that and you notice wow they start looking more younger and vibrant and that's exactly the point is that when we do have things to look forward to and a sense of optimism that has actually been shown optimism in itself to speed up cellular proliferation now cellular proliferation kind of on a simple note uh, a simple way to think about it is like this is is if we think about dish soap if we pour water on dish soap what happens? The cells bubble, like the cells increase and we get more, or the bubbles increase and we get more and more bubbles. It expands. So that happens with dish soap. With the cells, cells grow and divide, grow and divide, grow and divide. And then they heal the body. They replace cells. And our body continues to repair and regenerate and create new cells. So optimism, having something that we're looking forward to and excited about can help speed up and optimize cellular proliferation. So not only can have it, so to your point, exactly what you're saying also happens on a scientific level. When we, because I've seen people before where they go to retire and then it's like, well, what am I going to do today? And they think it's they're old. I give them two they years, to, three maybe, exactly. and then they die of old yeah, age. Because it's exactly, because part of it is, Part of in what their also 60s, happens in their 70s, that's it. That's all they have. Yeah, they have nothing to look forward to. So then their mind starts, and then their mind also sets in and says, I'm retired. Like, I, I there was somebody throughout my past that, uh, along even in my, my 20s, I saw this happen. There was a, uh, my basically at the time, uh, my partner, my relationship, uh, the basically like my mother-in-law if you will she started saying i'm so old i'm so old and i literally watched her age years in a very short oh, period dear. of time so i've seen that and yeah and it's like we, we, we're, we're, people will tell we're themselves so gone over our time we're gonna have to stop talking i'm oh. gonna have you right back <laughs> i i just have to have you right back we have so much to talk about we, we really we have do. So by the way, is I, that did you choose your cat to to match <laughs> your your room because that is such a I was trying to cat. cover him up. I was <laughs> No, no, no. No, your cat so goes with the entire decor of your of Okay, your you want to know what else your cat is in. It it's we've we have watched your cat walk across behind you. <laughs> And, and and lie down and i thought if that cat were a prop your cat matches the room so perfectly i, I isn't you, he beautiful cat right to do this <laughs> actually that's what i was trying to hide i was like so <laughs> no <laughs> so anyways let me tell you about i love that. the cat so much <laughs> the cat is perfect What's the cat's name? name? Okay, you're gonna laugh because okay, so I I I got him while I was working on my book to actually help keep my other cat busy while I was working on my oh, book. Cat now, 
<laughs> I do have one other cat. So they're they're buddies. They're they're so sweet together. So that's why I got him. So he's actually just about two years old as I was working on my book, but his name is Photon. So, which is funny because as you've read my book, it's bio photons, it's energy of the body. So, and he was like a little white light that's just bouncing around the house. And that is him. So his name is Photon. And, uh, and he's What's just the sweetest little name. I hesitate to ask. <laughs> <laughs> the other one's name is Bodhi. Oh, so I see. Bodhi. The other one is a civilian cat. This this one is a a deep thinker's cat. Okay. Oh my. He's dear. just a little ball of light that that jumps around, and and that's uh, that, so, and he's the sweetest. I'm so sorry. We have to he's stop talking. I could do this all day. <laughs> what 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 do you want people to take away from our conversation today? Um. Okay. Is there so any way to things. summarize this? I'm not sure there is. So many things. Look, by the way, just so you know, he's actually a rescue. So I did not actually pick his colors, but that's the universe for you. I mean, oh. I could not, he matches the cover of the book. He met like, I mean, yes, he, he kind of yes, fits exactly. in the whole oh, little so exactly. decor of everything. Oh, goes with everything. <laughs> Train him to just always oh, do this whenever you're interviewed. Just come in and make yourself <laughs> at home. <laughs> and, and whenever you were I making an emphatic point, you would stretch. It was just ideal. Just ideal. You, oh, you, did such, you stretch? Such a great interview, <laughs> little photon. So is so it he, you, I normally shut the door. Wait, wait, so what, what do I want people, people to take from this? It would be this. It would be number one is that even though, like, you know, I mentioned, oh, he's he's done with the interview. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, what I would want people to take from it is this is that, you know, we were talking about the four minute mile, how we used to think something was impossible. And now so many people have done it. And yes. the thing that is pivotal is this, is if we think about emotions, they're affecting the body and we don't really realize to the extent. And a simple way to think about it is like this, is that we've all heard before somebody having a panic attack, like a racing heart shortness of breath. Now imagine if people didn't know it was panic. And or anxiety. Now it's easy to imagine because all of the time people go to the emergency room, they think they're having a heart attack. And then the doctor says, oh, it's actually anxiety. And they don't realize that anxiety is actually affecting them in that panic. Now, if we take that basic concept, a profound concept, and we expound upon that, there are other emotions that are affecting the foot pain, the autoimmune, the leg pain, the back pain, the neck pain, the blood issue, the blah, blah, whatever it is, all of these other emotions are affecting the body and we just don't realize it's happening. And if we just understand emotions in a different way, not to where we just think positive, yes, that's great, but where we really shift the consciousness regarding emotions. So we shift them at a deeper level. We realize that we're truly incredible beings. And so it's about just creating that real change. And um, it's, it's pivotal, it's life-changing. And, and so that's what I also love about what you do, Roberta, is the fact that you're waking people up. You have this beautiful show that you're sharing with people about consciousness and the mind and, you know, and you're just so wise, so wise. And uh, when I grow up, I hope to be like you. Um, <laughs> you know, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear one. Um, We're going to do this again very soon. Thank you. I, I, I look forward to it. Thank you. For, thank you so much for being here. Everyone, I'm so sorry we've come to the end of our time. This this went too, much too quickly. Everyone, this has been Seagru. I can't even talk, obviously. <laughs> that cat really <laughs> in my mind as well. <laughs> This has been Seek Reality with Roberta <laughs> Grimes. I'm so happy you could be with us today. Please never forget, never forget that you are a powerful, eternal being. Obviously, since I feel eternal, I don't care being almost 80 years old. It doesn't matter to me. But you never began. You never will end. And when you get that, when you get all the implications of that fact, it's going to change everything in your life for the better. Next week, our guest will be Karen Anderson. She'll be with us for the seventh time. Karen is a natural psychic. She's been that from childhood and she loves animals. So she's gravitated toward becoming an animal psychic. She's documented her career in three books called Hear All Creatures, 
The Amazing Afterlife of Animals, and her recent book, which is called The Pet I Can't Forget, Finding Hope and Healing with Signs from the Afterlife. Karen is someone else who has long been a crowd favorite with Seek Reality listeners, and she loves animals enough now to have established her own sanctuary for aged pets that no one else wants. She'll take them in. I think you're going to love hearing from her, so please be sure to join us next week. And this week, what can I say? We've been talking with Brandy Gilmore, who has been with us for the second time, but not the last. After an accident, she was confined to a wheelchair with a painful condition, but you cannot keep Brandy Gilmore down. She did the research and she healed herself. In 2015, she wanted everybody else to know that she had healed herself. And she has, she's given a TEDx talk. She's doing demonstrating to the medical community and everybody else that you can't keep her down. Her podcast is called Heal Yourself, Change Your Life. And her new book, which is out this year, is called, and I recommend this book. And talking to her, I realized I, I should have made notes from the book because I have read so many books since then. I couldn't remember now. Was this in Brandy's book or was this in somebody else's book? Her book, which is great, is called he, uh, master your mind and energy to heal your body. Brandy was our guest for the first time just a few months ago, and I couldn't wait to have her back. So I plugged her in again as soon as I could. And we're going to have her right back again as soon as I can plug her in again. Um, I, I think that that there are a few people we probably ought to have as regulars because I just can't. I mean, interviewing people once a week can be as hard slog if they're not people you really care about. And so one little by little, we're having regulars who are only people that I just love to talk about and talk to and just enjoy so much. And uh, I think that uh, she's going to become one of those. Anyway, um, I've just I've loved today and I'm going to love every time she comes back again. So again, one more time, that book is Master your mind and energy to heal your body. And it was just a joy to read. And her name is Brandy Gilmore. As you know, our great friend Craig Hogan is the president of Seek Reality Online. And that's our one-stop resource for all things afterlife. Just go to seekreality.com. I don't care if you don't want to live after you die. You don't have a choice. It's going to happen anyway. So Go there, learn the ultimate truth from our dear friend Craig, and enjoy your afterlife right from the moment of your death. And teachingsbyjesus.com is your single resource for all the beautiful divine truths that are brought to us in perfect love by the greatest teacher of them all, Master Jesus. He didn't start Christianity, and he's been waiting patiently for the one that the Romans started, finally dies, which it's doing now. So you can go and you can learn the truths at, on teachingsbyjesus.com, you can learn the truths from the one who actually gave us the truth. And that's all I have time to talk about because we've already run over time. So this, meanwhile, this has been Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. And please enjoy and make the most of this coming week in our one reality, knowing that you are a powerful eternal being and you most of all in this whole universe are infinitely, perfectly, and eternally loved. Mm -hmm.